This morning, I would like to begin a series concerning the biblical doctrine of man. We all need to know it just simply because God's revealed it is good for us to understand about ourselves. And myriads of people in this country don't really know what they are. That may sound strange, but it's the truth. We used to say, and I preached it, and I heard preachers before me preach it, why are we here? For what are we here? And where are we going? Well, if you'll think about those questions, nowadays you're liable to hear anything. Think about from where do we come. Think all the answers that are out there. Think about, why are we here? And then, with some, where are we going? As far as the flesh will take us, and that's the end of it all, at the end of our days on earth. But the Bible informs us. Let me state this again. Once I prove, I underscore the word prove, that the Bible is the inerrant, the all-sufficient, final, complete, revelation of God to man, then the Bible itself becomes proof. That's why Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 21, prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. That's why we're taught whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by Him, Colossians 3, 17. I must know in my mind that the Bible is the very word of God. I understand from the Bible, according to the inspired writer Paul to Timothy originally, that I am to study to show myself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Well, this is so true when it comes then to our understanding ourselves. For those in the auditorium class recently, and even at present, on Wednesday evening, we're talking about psychology from the standpoint of what the Bible has to offer us. And I emphasize over and over and over again that you don't approach the Bible as a psychology textbook. You approach the Bible as the revealed mind of God primarily, fundamentally, foremost, and always dealing with the sin problem. How men are saved from their sins. Once a person becomes a Christian, the way the New Testament defines Christian and uses it, Then those great benefits that it can be and should be and God wants it to be are for us and that he's not given us the spirit of fear but of love, power, of a sound mind. That comes to the faithful child of God. That must be kept in mind but something that will help us is to understand what is the biblical doctrine of man. I cite you first of all The 8th Psalm, wherein David said in verse 3, concerning our subject, When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air and the fish of the sea. And whatsoever passes through the paths of the sea. O Lord our God, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. There's another psalm that I would like to turn to that will help us in introducing our subject. It's in Psalm 39, beginning in verse 14. Keep in mind what we just read. Listen to these three verses, 14, 15, and 16 of Psalm 139. 
I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned. When as yet there was none of them. What is man that thou art mindful of him? A study of the biblical doctrine of man. The first point I want to make this morning concerning this important subject is that man is created by God. The Bible says, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Then it says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Genesis 1, 26 and 27. The good word of God further says that God formed the first human body from the dust of the earth. That he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. In the Hebrew it's plural, breath of lives. And man became a living soul. Genesis 2, 7. We won't take time to go into all the business of the generic term soul and how it can be used and how it is used right here and why it says breath of lives. But nevertheless, it states that this is the first human body and it's formed by God. But then God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. Genesis 2.18 a help that is suitable for him. Thus God caused a deep sleep to come upon Adam, and he slept. And he, that is God, took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib, which the Lord had taken from man, made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Genesis 2, 21 through 23. Coming over to the New Testament, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ said to the Pharisees, Have you not read that he who made or created them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Matthew 19, verse 5. The inspired apostle Paul had this to declare in his writing. The God that made the world and all things therein, he... Being Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Neither is he served by men's hands as though he needed anything. Seeing he himself giveth to all life and breath and all things. And he made a one nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth. Having determined their appointed seasons, the bounds of their habitation that they should seek God if happily they might feel after Him and find Him, though He be not far from each one of us. For in Him we live and move and have our being. As certain even of your own poets have said, for we are also His offspring. Acts 17, 24 through 28. You'll notice that that's from Paul's great sermon in Athens before the philosophers of his day. Man is here. You 
are here. And that's a fact. Man is here either as the product of God's creation or as the product of chance, organic evolution. Now, if you're dealing in logic, you would simply say here there is a, quote, strong disjunctive, unquote. In other words, there's no other possibility. It is an either or situation. And it makes me a little difference whether you have 14 PhDs from Harvard and Yale and wherever you might get them and all kinds of sciences. Or you don't. Or somewhere in between. That's just the way it is and you can't get over it. If not by creation, then by evolution. If not by evolution, then by creation. If man is the product, I say if he is the product of evolution, number one, at some time in the distant past, there was a non-human that gave birth to a human. Or, I say or, number two, some non-human gave birth to a non-human which non-human transformed into a human now some of you if not most of you at least having at least heard of it you're familiar with what took place 40 years ago in the war and flu debate but there was another one after that the Warren Matson debate well, renowned atheist, especially Dr. Flew at that time. Dr. Flew and Dr. Matson both admitted in writing, both admitted in writing, in answers to questions that were presented to them during that debate, that it was not, and I'm quoting, quote, it was not by birth, unquote, and, quote, it was not by transformation, unquote. But, but, if not by birth, and if not by transformation, then not by evolution. But if not by evolution, oh, they don't like this. It's crowding them right into that corner and they can't get out of it. I don't care who they are. If not by evolution, then by creation. And by creation implies the existence of God. Now you bring on whoever you want to bring on. That declares himself, I am an atheist, I know it, and I can prove it, and I can show you there is no God. He'll never get over what I just said. He will never get over what I just said. And if you think that's just brag, then try to find one. They'll give us the opportunity to let him for four nights show the error of this and why he can prove God does not exist. And this is the very point which Brother Warren was making in his debate with these fellas. It would be the point we would make with them now or until the end of time. It's amazing to me, and this is, this is so funny, not humorous, and yet it may be humorous too, peculiar, that, it, that, it's, that you can take the theory of evolution and prove the existence of God. Just like we just did. The theory of evolution is not supported by science. Now let that sink in. Because you would think over all the years up to the present, that the way that it's touted in all the universities and other such places of where they're ever learning and ever able to come to the knowledge of the truth, that must be the case. That evolution is supported by science. 
The theory, and I underscore the word theory, theory of evolution cannot get off the ground without what is called, quote, spontaneous generation, unquote. But there's no scientific evidence for spontaneous generation. Now, in the debate Brother Warren had with uh, Dr. Matson, Dr. Matson, uh, Matson frankly admitted that there was, and, and there is, we can say that, no evidence to support the theory of spontaneous generation. Now, what did he just admit by implication? That there can't be evolution. There is no process, or we may say there is no mechanism known to science by which single cell beings developed into highly complex multi cell beings. The theory, I underscore theory, the theory of evolution is not supported by paleontology. The theory finds no support in the so-called fossil records. In fact, the fossil records so-called, let me underscore this, begins, begins with highly complex, sophisticated forms such as trilobites, which had nerves, muscles, and eyes. A fellow by the name of Dr. Charles J. Felix, Ph.D. in paleontology, I don't know whether he's still alive or not, says of the fossil record, and I put it in quotes because that's what they call it, to mean a certain thing, and there is a record, but whether it means a certain thing or not is the whole point. But he says of the fossil record of the evolutionist that it does not exist anywhere in fact. It only exists on paper. Now, my view is, let them rise up and counter these things and give us proof that we're wrong, that I just stated a, a lie. And they can show what I've said is a lie, and they won't hesitate to do it. There isn't any scientific evidence that the demands of evolution could be met in a million million or billion billion or trillion, trillion, or higher than our national debt, years. Folks, listen, it is not a matter of time. It's not a matter of time. If there is no evidence that one monkey, and when you say with one typewriter, I guess you'd have to say he's a progressed monkey and use a keyboard of a computer could compose volume one of the Encyclopedia Britannica in 100 years, then where is the evidence that 500 monkeys in 500 years could do the same thing? There is no evidence. Oh, but they'll produce what they say is evidence, and we'll show you it is not evidence and all the meaning of the word evidence. The problem is that when you get into these things in science, the average person, is not educated in the details of each one of the branches of science. And they don't know what these fellows are saying, right or not. There's got to be some way that you can, if you please, try them on for size. The theory of evolution is not supported by science. Now, I know that what you hear and what is written and touted all over the place from one end of the country and the world to another is that it's so. But I've noticed that people who are capable of handling these fellows find it very hard to get them to publicly take a stand. One reason is because when the scientist, according to the scientific method, begins to talk about things of the past, he's left his scientific method. Remember, empirical evidence is that which you can examine with your five senses. Now, where is there a man alive today 
that can examine origins with his five senses. So he's left the area, the sphere of the scientist. And he's moved off into the area of philosophy or religion, or both. Because empirical means will not test origins. No way it can do it. The theory of evolution is not supported by science. It's not supported by the branches of science, more particularly biology, zoology, anthropology, paleontology, geology, or cosmology. Man is a being. Indeed, as the psalmist said, an amazing being created by God Almighty. The next point is that man is a rational being. Now, we may act sometimes very irrational, but you can't be irrational unless you're first rational. You've got to think about that a minute, Jeff. Many of the words, we got two Jeffs, so both of you think about it. Many of the words used in the Bible, used in the Bible, to set forth the nature of man are words that stress man's rationality. They emphasize that man has the ability to think. Doesn't mean he always thinks, but he has the ability to think, to reason, to perceive, to understand, to plan, to purpose, to will, to determine, to analyze, to hope, to remember, to accomplish. These are attributes of the human mind. This mind clearly differentiates man from the, lack of a better way to deal with it, lower animal creation. And it's this particular quality or attribute of man to which God addresses himself. So it's God through his written revelation the Bible, 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17, speaks to the human mind. In other words, God made man to come to knowledge of things, to think about them, to draw conclusions and to act or not act. And when he revealed his mind to that man made in his moral image, a rational man, then he accommodated his revelation, his will in words so man, if he wanted to, could understand it. And therefore you have all the teaching one way or the other throughout the Bible. You have the obligation to study God's will. You couldn't say that man wasn't able to understand it. Now you may understand the thing. Someone would say it that way. In a million different ways. The truth of the matter is. You may misunderstand it. In a million different ways. But if a thing is understood as God intended it to be understood, there's just one way. It sort of echoes something, doesn't it? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto me or unto the Father, but by me, John 14, 6. God commands all men then, as I said earlier, to study His will. We are obligated, of course it's a privilege, to learn God's will. To do God's will. And then to teach others God's will. And even defend God's will. We are commanded, as I said in the beginning, to prove. Underscore that word prove. And all that it means. Prove all things. Not some things, but all things. Hold fast that which is good. Man has the ability to discern and know the difference. And to prove and all that that means. First Thessalonians 5.21 It is to man alone. Of God's creation. That he has granted the marvelous privilege of prayer. The privilege of actually speaking to God. A privilege inherent in man's own rationality. Man's own being made in God's image. These things of course as you know could be developed a lot further. But we must cut it somewhere I will pause and say this uh, many of you have pets or you have had whether it's a bird or fish or 
cats or dogs or whatever. You ever just sit down and contemplate those animals? They're creatures of God, aren't they? God in His mind saw fit for them to be on the earth and created them as they are. Knowing that they're made lower than man, and by that I mean there is no eternal spirit in them that will continue on after their bodies die. They're biologically alive. When they're dead, they're gone. Nothing after that. Nothing in the Bible teaches there is. They're fitted for this world and this world only. And yet, they can remember how much they remember. Well, there's all sorts of studies in how much a cat can remember, a dog can remember, an ape can remember, and so on. How they go about it, what they remember. But it's rather amazing to say, watch one and try to figure out what's going on. How do they choose because they can? You know, most all that's there in an animal, if not all, is by genetic code. DNA, deoxyribose nucleic acid. It's there. It's all in that code. And where'd that code come from? Because scientists realize now that it's all the whatever you are physically is there. It's a language. Did you hear us read that a while ago? About God's language for us in the Psalms. Well, none of the Bible is written in modern day scientific terminology. You wouldn't expect it to be. Since the terminology didn't come along to many, many years after the Bible's written. But it's there. So how does all that work? All I know is it works by the will of God. Who made a cat to be a cat. And he's never going to be a rhinoceros. A rhinoceros is never going to be a little puppy. That rhinoceros programmed by God's genetic code to be a rhinoceros, and that's why he is. And that's why crocodiles, not your pet cat. Those things like that, if people would just think about them, would tell us something. Well, anyway, my third point, and it'll be the last one for today. Man is a free moral being. God created him like that. Genesis chapter 3 records the transgression of Adam and the entrance of sin, the transgression of God's law, 1 John 3, 4, into the world, which world, of course, God made. And you see that dealt with by Paul, too, in Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. Now, the question is often asked, why did God make man capable of sinning? Well, the answer lies in the question itself. The fact that God did make man. If God had made this creature so that he could not sin, uh, this creature would have been a machine, a robot. He wouldn't have been man. Someone said one time, as Shakespeare wrote, that a rose by any other name smells just as sweet. And the guy said, yeah, and a rose by any other name may not be a rose. <laughs> Involved in man's rationality, because God made man. Man is human. He's separate from anything else God created. But there is involved in this rational, intellectual capabilities of man, his capacity capability of being a moral being capable I'd say he would always be what he ought to be but he's capable of being what he ought to be man has the capacity to be properly concerned about what is right and what is wrong to be concerned about God's will for his life being God created him and he's God's creature God, you see, wants man to choose to come to him, to love him. Because he is God and all that that implies. But he wants them to come and to love of their own free will. So God had to create man so he could do that and create a place where he could have choices. God respects man's free moral agency. And God does not violate man's free will. God loved Adam and Eve. 
The Bible teaches the very essence of deity is love. You couldn't have any better, put it in quotes, father than God who created Adam and Eve. And you love them with a love like we all need to love our children. But as finite human beings, we, we don't as much as we do love them. But we make mistakes. We're humans and we make mistakes. God didn't make any mistakes and they still sin. Is that food for thought? God made no mistakes, but they still sin. One thing it does is mom and dad is not responsible for children once they're grown on their own. And all that we mean on their own for everything they do. You see, you won't be able someday to tell them, no, you can't do that. Because most time they'll outlive you, you'll be dead and gone, and they'll have to make choices for themselves. There's a very strong Calvinistic influence in the world. People used to know what Calvin taught, and they used to think the Bible taught it, and they knew what they were teaching. Now they're still influenced by Calvinism, but they may not know who John Calvin is. But Calvinism holds, number one, that God, from eternity, has already predetermined every individual who will ever be saved and every individual who will ever be lost. And number two, that there is no free will, that is no free moral agency of man, that if you are numbered among the lost, then you never can be saved. And if you are numbered among the saved, you never can be lost. Well, in contrast to this rank false doctrine, is not taught by the Bible. Note the following. Number one, now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, I notice he's not whispering this. He's crying out, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. John 7, 37. And they cried back, I don't know whether I'm one of the elect. Why are you as God in the flesh inviting us to do something we can't do because we've inherited Adam's original sin? And there's got to be a direct work of the Holy Spirit on us before we can respond. But some of us were predetermined to be lost. We never can be saved. And some were predestined to be saved. We can't be lost. We don't know what to do. And Jesus said, what? <laughs> and that's Calvinism. But the scripture says also, if any man will, he shall know of the teaching. If any man will, he shall know of the teaching, whether it is of God or whether I speak for myself. John 7, verse 17. You can tell the difference by the powers God gave you as a free moral agent and a rational creature. Another point, we'll say number three. Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Matthew eleven twenty-eight through 30. How does a Calvinist answer that? Four. The writer of Hebrews said of Christ and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Hebrews 5 9. Another point, 5. Closing out the divine record forevermore. And the bride and the spirit say, Come, or the spirit and the bride say, Come. And he that heareth, let him come. And he that is athirst, let him come. He that will, let him take the water of life freely. Revelation 22, 17. Now it's interesting about that little word L-E-T, let. In the Greek, it means come. That's your duty to come. Well, it's a duty I can't perform because I can't act of my own free will. Well, the Lord didn't know it. He said it's your duty to do what you can do and I'm not asking you above what you can do and you must do it if you're to benefit from what I freely offer you that you don't deserve and cannot merit. But you must decide. Man has the right to come. He has the ability to come. And he has the obligation to come if he's to benefit from all God's done for us that we never could do for ourselves. 
And you know the people who were Jews on Pentecost, who were persuaded by the preaching of Peter and the other apostles that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Messiah, Son of God, that the very one they looked for, they had killed. Peter said, you have taken the wicked hands of crucified and slain. The scripture says the truth understood pricked them in their heart. They cried out unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And that implies they had control of themselves and they would do it if they knew. The Holy Spirit that acted miraculously that day did not act upon the hearers. It acted upon the apostles to prove they were the ambassadors of the court of heaven and what they were speaking was from God and not from man. It was up to the people to listen, to exercise their powers, to understand as God created them and to make a decision and act accordingly. And they were free to do it for they had the ability to do it. And many of them did. And after they were told as believers, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. They did. Verse 41. Then they that glad received his word were baptized. They were added unto them about 3,000 souls. They had the power. They had the ability. God made them that way. And they demonstrated their faith in the truth, their love of Jesus Christ, and exercised their free moral agency to comply with the terms of Prince Emmanuel's salvation. And they obeyed the gospel. The power of God to save man, Romans 1.16, to which the church is charged to preach it to every creature, and you know now why. The great biblical doctrine of man. We'll continue with it, Lord willing, next week. If you're subject to the call of Christ and obedience to the gospel, you're lost in sins. You see, you can know you're lost, but you can know how to be saved. And we studied it this morning. Will you receive? You have the power to. You have the ability to do. Will you receive with meekness the proper attitude of submission? The engrafted word, which will save your soul. If you'll humbly obey it. Believing in Christ as the Son of God. Repenting of your sins. Confessing your faith in Christ. And completing your obedience to the gospel. By being immersed in water. By the authority of Christ. Into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. To obtain the remission of your past sins. You do that. The Lord will add you to His church. You can live faithful to Him forever. But as a child of God. If you have sinned. Then God's second law of pardon is to repent of that sin. Come confessing it. And pray God for forgiveness. We'll do that with you. That is, we'll pray with you to that end. If you're subject then to the blessed gospel of our Lord, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.